Welcome to the Air Power Airwaves, the Air Power Manufacturing Solutions podcast series where we talk about manufacturing issues that impact you. Hey there, it's Travis Stairwalt, and welcome to another episode of Air Power Airwaves. Got some special guests sitting next to me. Uh, first of all, Kyle. What's going on, Travis? Welcome back to another podcast. Yeah, man. We're racking them up, aren't we? I love being here. All right. It's fun. Uh, Kyle, you are the sales and marketing leader for Air Power. That's right. And uh, kind of a jack of all trades with uh, technology. I'm learning. Yes. We're going <laughs> to both learn today. I'm totally learning. I'm excited about this one. <laughs> All right, and sitting to my left is Chris Husson with AW Lake. How are you doing, Chris? I am good. It's Very a good. pleasure to be here. Looking forward to this. Yep, uh, had a great dinner last night. Very good. Had a lot of fun. Thank Absolutely. you very much for that. Uh, you are the general manager for AW Lake. Correct. Okay. Um, one thing before we go on, if you, if you, as we get into this conversation, if you have any questions whatsoever, the number that you need to call and ask for in, how to get in touch with this guy or how to get in touch with this guy or myself, call 1-800-334-1001. And the website of websites you need to remember is airpower-usa.com. You can actually get more information about A.W. Lake uh, as you're learning about them today. You can get more information uh, just by going to the website. So um, is there a brands page? There's going to be. Yes, There's going to be a brands page. Once this podcast launches today, there'll be a brands page that'll tie to AW Lake. There'll be the podcast loaded there, as well as some other reference material. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. All right. So, without further ado, let's talk about you and, and AW Lake. Who, who are you and who is AW Lake? Well, so um, <clears throat> I've been with AW Lake for a long time. We talked about that last night. Almost 36 years. Wow. So, I started with... Uh, AW company back in end of the 80s, 1988, uh, doing electronic manufacturing. Uh, got my engineering degree in electro engineering in 1994 and uh, started to help design some of the products, also some of the mechanical ones, the meters, but also the sensors and displays. Um, early 2000s, uh, I took the role as engineering manager. Eventually, about 2014, I moved into the operations side, took over some of the quality aspects as well. And then mid-July this year, I was blessed with given the opportunity to take over as general manager. So it's been a, an exciting road to get here. Yeah, so I'm very excited very to good. make some changes. Yeah, nice so yeah. give us a, like a little bit of a general overview on who is A.W. Lake. I mean, what is the – give us that snapshot of who A.W. Lake okay. is. So – AW Lake Company, we're a manufacturer of flow meters, flow measuring products, um, primarily for the industrial applications. We do a lot of paints and coatings. We do oil and gas. Um, we also do cooling flows, things of that nature. Uh, but AW Lake Company actually came about in end of the 80s. Jack Lake started Lake Monitors, and he developed a, a line of variable area of meters and pedal turbines. And then early 2000s became part of what's called Tazi Group. A W company, where I started, uh, was initially a distributor of flow meters from one of our now sister companies, Chem Coopers in Germany. And Axel Weinreich, that started that company, then developed electronic sensors for the meters uh, and also did a pretty nice line of uh, multi-channel PID closed-loop controllers, a lot for the paint industry and such. And that was before most PLC nowadays have it, but they didn't have it back then. So we kind of got, got that going pretty well. And then AW Lake Company became part of the Tazi Group in 2006. And that's when Lake and AW kind of merged together and became AW Lake. Okay. Uh, and since then, um, the group called Tazi Group uh, has grown quite a bit. Uh, we recently, last year, split into Test and Automation Group and Measurement, which is where we're at in Flow Meters. And we're about 12 companies that do flow measurements. We have a great company called Pyromation that even does temperature pressure sensors. Uh, and things like that. So we have a big group uh, of companies behind us, a lot of resources. And and from a flow measurement standpoint, um, you know, we have a wide variety of products as well uh, we've gotten into. We actually uh, saw some of your stuff in the back. We'll talk about that here in yeah. a little while, but yeah, um, that, that's some pretty interesting technology. So, so the Lake piece came from Jack Lake. Correct. What does AW stand for? So AW, that's actually just the initial of the, the founder, Oxlavirac. Okay. Uh, that, so again, it was more of a distribution of, of flow meters, 
and he focused more on the electronics and the closer controllers back in the day. Uh, one of the first to come out with fiber optic sensors also for um, for the paint industry as well, uh, that we did that. So. Okay. I had one more question about your background. So yep. design engineering. Correct. So you were like the guy. Do you have like a a special baby that's like your pride and joy that you designed? Uh, so one that uh, I was part of as, as, as a team was um, back in early 2000s, we had a very big project with a major uh, tractor manufacturer where we developed a flow meter for them to help uh, with an auto steering system they're working on. Uh, so one thing for us is not just a matter of selling off-the-shelf products. One thing we pride ourselves on is also customization. You know, we recognize that within the technologies, you know, for many people, what we have off the shelf works. But for some people, when there's some volume involved as well, sometimes we need to customize to make sure that it fits the application as well. Not just from a functional standpoint, but also how it fits and integrates in their systems. So we've done that as well. And that's part of our business. We're working on growing even more to be able to customize for applications uh, so it fits Priorly as well beyond just the measuring aspect. Okay, that was cool. Okay, so talking about the different products, mm -hmm. do you want to break down uh, before we move to Andrew? Do you want to break down the product categories? Yeah, let's go to walk us down through that to give us a basic synopsis of that. Yeah, so from a technology and accuracy standpoint, kind of from low to high. So on the lower end, we have what we call our variable area meters uh, and paddle turbines. So the variable error meters are primarily more visual indicators of flow, although we do have an option to give either a relay or analog output as well. Uh, but there you're looking at 2 to 4% of full scale. On the pedal turbines, which again is primarily for uh, lighter fluids, primarily water, a lot of cooling applications, again, you're about 2% of full range. But a lot of people like them also because they're very low pressure drop products. So for, for many people, it fits. Um, we have one company that sells medical equipment that uses it for their cooling systems. Okay. And we sell thousands of those a year. Then you start to move into uh, standard axial turbines. Um, again, a bit more accurate. You usually have to 1% accuracy. Still primarily uh, water. This is one of the key ones, but also chemical. Chemical injections It's very popular as well. But the turndown ratio there usually is only about 10 to 1. So for applications with broad tur turndown ratios, Turbines does have some limitations as well. Okay. Then we start to move into gear meters that I know you're very familiar with right. in your applications. Uh, very good for injections, especially, uh, because they're very responsive. You can get very good resolution on them as well. Uh, and depending on the size, some of them have over 200 to 1 turn down ratio as well. And with some of our sensors, we can linearize and we can actually extend both the accuracy and the turn down ratio as well. And that's for some people is very important. Uh, we can also help increase resolution for some application as well. Uh, pressure drop is a little bit higher, but again, for very high precision, we're half percent or better on those. Why, why would pressure drop be more in a gear meter? Uh, just simply because of the flow path. So most of them, we come in from the side, you're going to do a 90 degree turn into the cavity, and then we have very, very tightly uh, precise machine cavities again, so that when you rotate the gears coming back out, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you will have some pressure drop. And usually it's exponential with increase of flow. The pressure drop increases exponentially. Um, if pressure drop is a concern or if it's very thick fluid, then we also have helical meters. And helical meters is another way to go in and do, especially for thicker fluids, um, like body coats, mm -hmm. uh, sound deadeners, things like that. Um, people will use those a lot as well. Okay. Uh, but again, positive space from technology. And then when you get into the higher levels, now you're looking at the Coriolis. So the Coriolis, that's kind of top of the line. It's straight through tubes, um, bend in different shapes depending on the technologies. But now you're down at 0.1% accuracy. And a lot of people like that as well from as far as the Coriolis. It measures based on mass, not volume. But because it can also measure density, we can correct and correlate back into a volume measurement as well. So we do have that choice. But again, for people that really want high accuracy, the Coriolis is definitely the way to go. And with no moving parts, Maintenance usually is lower as well. Excellent. Yeah. I, I had a customer the other day ask about a mass meter. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a terminology or is that a type of meter? Well, so it, it, it's both. But primarily, again, when we talk about Coriolis, it is a mass meter because that's the, the primary measuring measurement range that you get is mass, not volume like you would on a gear meter. Gotcha. Uh, in some applications, I know, for example, in the print industry, a lot of what they do is based on mat, mass. They'll fill totes. 
and weigh those on a scale. So they want the mass measurement to begin with. So for them, that really works out quite well. And that's okay. the way to go. So if they say mass, I need to think Coriolis. Mass and Coriolis is the okay. way to go. Absolutely. Very and that's cool. some of the highest precision you can get. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, so I think pleasure. we're going to shift gears, bring your partner in here, and let's uh, let's go deep dive the Coriolis meter. Sounds good. You're talking awesome. to the right guy. Thank you so All much. Right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. All right. So while we uh, change seats here, what are you gonna like grill me? I'm no, I'm 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 learning today. <laughs> I'm in no, but, metering technology is cool because you know, thirty forty years ago, like this data, you know, knowing. Like, you know, your fluid stream, your path, your viscosity, your temperature, that was probably not as relevant as it is today. Or there was a lot of guessing. Or, a lot of guessing. A lot of handwriting. You know. Yeah, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like. It feels right. degrees. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have got our next person on deck, Andrew Hall. How are you? Lovely. How are you? Doing good. You guys have met? Absolutely. Yes, All right. Sir. Andrew's a great rep for us. This is your second time to the Hot Point it is. branch? Yeah. Okay, good deal. Well, we actually uh, had some show and tell back in the back of the plant. We, we have, we're not going to really talk about that application, but sure. we have uh, at least six of your Coriolis meters back. That's right. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Or should um, I say mass meter? A mass meter. <laughs> yeah. Have to be very careful. Yeah, you do. do. Yeah. <laughs> the terminology, though, it, it's so intertwined, you know, so when customer asks for one thing, you got to really understand what they're asking for. Right. Right. All right. So, Andrew, tell us a little bit about your uh, your position with uh, AW Lake and where you what you do. Yeah. Well, it's my first day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so, I'm with... <laughs> So I am, uh, I'm just a territory sales guy, you know, but it's, uh, being in a small nimble company, uh, there's a lot that we do. There's a lot that I do, I kind of in way of tailoring our distribution network, you know, that's one of the, the big things that we're putting a lot of emphasis on. And that's really where y'all have been excellent for us. We like our partners. That's we it. like our vendor partners. That's it. So we look, obviously, I, as, as I'm evaluating who's who, you know, obviously Air Power has been using us for a long time. But really the thing, and historically speaking, the, the value's been untapped. And understanding how our partners, like yourself, have value-add capabilities, how you fabricate, how you can go in and inspect, how you are the professional and leveraging your knowledge with our product and enabling you to be more effective, more efficient. Yeah. That's my job. So, so do that. They're like, what, what are some questions or some thoughts that like our team needs to be thinking about when in their field, you know, we get asked every day, like, Hey, we need a pump to mm -hmm. pump this. Right. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean an AW like meter. Right. But they probably want the data and information that a meter could provide. So like, just super broad general terms, right? Like what are some of the, the key words or questions or how do we bolt on some of this really important technology to very simple solutions? Like what would you ask to then continue to journey that? I think it is going to be job dependent. And by that, I mean the, the things that y'all do require accuracy, mm -hmm. requires repeatability. It, there's so much as far as questions are concerned with regard to, you know, when we're specking out this pump, what kind of accuracy do you need? Just starting at the baseline there, what kind of accuracy do you need out of your meter, whenever that may be? And from there, tailoring down to, you know, have you considered Coriolis meters? One of the things that we encounter is Coriolis meters were so expensive in the 90s and in the early 2000s. And granted, comparatively, they are still expensive. But when you get into hey, we need high precision. Your precision doesn't have to come secondary to attainability or cost. So understanding what kind of accuracy do you need? I mean, what is your target? What is your carrying cost? How are we able to get you the best meter to make your process the best at a cost that's not going to make your boss say, you're fired? 
You know, <laughs> so understanding a little bit about that is really interesting and understanding their applications like y'all do so well with. So for the person that's watching this right now or the multiple people who have never heard the term Coriolis meter, mm -hmm. I think I think we need to do that now. That's a good one. What is a Coriolis meter and what does it do? Sure. All right. So a Coriolis meter in its most base function is a flow meter, right? And that's where most people like stop in their understanding of what this thing actually does. So a Coriolis meter, what it does is, like Chris mentioned earlier, it is a mass meter. So it measures the mass of the media going through it. Well, that's interesting because we're getting a highly accurate reading out of mass where most of us are using um, velocity, yeah. your, your mag meters, right? Your turbine meters and the rate at which something is moving through is wholly dependent on the reading you get. While that's still true, a mass meter is so much more precise. It has such a wide turn down and a Coriolis meter specifically, the way it works is really interesting. So what we do is we have a flow divider. As the main flow comes in, we split that flow into two concurrent flow paths. And here's where the wizardry kind of gets really interesting, right? <laughs> As a mass, which of course all mass has, uh, I'm sorry, all matter has mass. As the mass goes through these tubes, there's a certain frequency, like kind of a fingerprint, if you will, that allow that deflects the tubes and makes them vibrate. There's a certain frequency, if you will, okay. and the way that they vibrate, the way that those tubes deflect, they can enter the uh, the way they interface with the electronics is it's like, okay. So we're doing this kind of mass through these tubes. It must be this. And it, it, it that's really dumbing it down, trust me. The wizard in the back doesn't tell me what he does with these things, so I don't understand it myself. No, I'm kidding. I thought the wizard was in the little Coriolis device. Well, yes, there's a smaller <laughs> wizard in the Coriolis. He is very small. Uh, <laughs> I'm just but, super enthralled at like listening to how a Coriolis meter works, like, Corey Ozola speeder. There you go. There you go. So you can tell the type of material going through a Coriolis meter by the vibration. You can, you can tell the properties. Properties. Okay. Yeah. So let's say you have oil, or let's just stick with oil. You have oil going through your uh, with your meter. What happens is that meter can tell the density on uh, the way it was calibrated. Well, let's say you have water that gets into that oil stream. You can actually, without necessarily the flow rate changing, you can see the density start changing. And you're like, wait, there's something chemically. The properties are changing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Something's happening. And it's really interesting. We have a manufacturer who uses this for their fuel and water. They're having ingress into their fuel lines. And what's happening is as they move their various ATVs and that kind of stuff around the floor, historically what happened, they were putting fouled uh, fuel in their in their vehicles and that's hugely problematic right mm -hmm. so what we did is we installed one of these meters and it's a lot a lot less about the flow rate and a lot more about the the balance of fuel and water because you don't want water right well they have eight tanks they're huge tanks that hold their fuel what they're able to do is the second their pump starts going they're able to see when that density starts shifting they can cut off the pump obviously cut off the fuel supply to these respective uh stations and from there they save a ton of money because they're not putting bad product into what is otherwise a perfect product yeah i would imagine right yeah. so there's some things like that that are really interesting beyond just what flow you're getting right and when you say cut off like your coriolis meter can be integrated into say, an MES system or a plant-wide network. And so I'd get an alarm that was like, hey, man, like we got some bad things down the line. Okay, so it's like preventative alarming. Yeah, preventative absolutely. Okay. And that's such an interesting thing that you say that. You know, one of the most, I think, effective sales reps, if you will, just as a profile, they understand that it's not just a matter of using a flow meter on, hey, I've got 10 gallons of whatever running through this pipe, right? It's a matter of system integrity. It's a holistic indicator. It's the heartbeat of the integrity of whatever that meter is in. And being that it's a Coriolis meter, you can get your density. 
is you can get your temperature and of course you can get your flow rate all out of one meter. And we'll kind of talk about an interesting application uh, that I actually saved the company $80,000 in a flow controller by about a $10,000 flow meter. There's some really cool stuff that we yeah. can talk about. Okay. That way. Let's talk about, well, we talked a little bit about metering there, but we, when we discuss this podcast ahead of time, we know that we want to talk about metering and data collection. Mm -hmm. So you want to get that? Go for it. Yeah. So yeah, I know. yeah, yeah. Data. You, yeah. You're ready so, to go. <laughs> yeah. So the interesting thing about information in the industrial world and process in the first place is that historically, there was kind of two things. One, it was visual. So what does that require? It requires people. Mm -hmm. And what are people great at? Yeah, but I can't tell the difference if my gas has water in it. Right. Well, and that's very true. I know we put gas in it. That's exactly right. But what we also did, just to kind of follow that trail, is you had people watching a mechanical meter, right? And again, people, they're really good at not doing their job. <laughs> so there's this interesting thing where it was like there was a breakdown of information because of people being the bottleneck but the information that you could get was either incomplete noise or it was really expensive mm -hmm. and now we've kind of turned that well we've turned the corner far beyond turned the corner of information is not only inexpensive but it's reliable not only is it reliable it's something that we can do so much with. It's not just a 4 to 20 signal anymore. It's not just a single metric. And when you start looking at the way all of these things interface with one another from a flow meter, a pressure transducer, to an RTD, to a valve, or whatever that may be, it's almost like an orchestra. Each component is a respective instrument in that orchestra, and it blends together. And again, it is a holistic approach to how these things work. Now, specifically speaking with a Coriolis meter, for instance, like I mentioned, there's so many other metrics that we can get out of, uh, out of this meter. There's a major auto manufacturer who does EVs, and um, in their battery testing booths, just to get into that, they called me and they said, look, we have an $80,000 flow controller. It can give us what we want it to do but it is not sustainable across our five lines. And I said, okay, that's, that's interesting. So tell me more. What are you trying to do? And as we start getting into this application, it was really interesting because what they were experiencing with a mechanical meter was these huge influx. Negative 40 was a water glycol mix. Negative 40 to 250 degrees F. That's a significant change. Well, what happens to liquid when you apply heat or you apply cold? The viscosity just you know, wildly different. Well, a mechanical meter can't see that. A mechanical meter, again, as we discussed at the beginning, it sees the velocity. It sees the rate at which something is passing through it. And if it's thicker, it can really mess it up because a mechanical meter is very much set to a specific uh, viscosity. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we were able to take one meter and we were able to get, of course, the temperature out of it and the density and give them down to 0.2% accuracy out, even across that whole temperature range. Now, what that does to them is it gives them the satisfaction of knowing we're right. But beyond that, it's really good for your shareholders. It's really good in saying, hey, our car is durable. Not only is it durable, our battery pack lasted X amount of cycles at X temperature and mm -hmm. X temperature swing. Yep. So what we see again is a lot more about understanding the properties and the uh, direction of a system, again, versus just a simple five gallons a minute. All right. Understanding what a, dense, what a uh, mass flow meter can do for your process is really interesting. And there's a reason they're not out there more. And I hope we can talk about that here in a bit. Yeah. You threw out 0.2%. So like from a manufacturing standpoint, that seems really, really accurate. It is. Do most people need plus or minus 5, plus or minus 10? And y'all just are like, nope, we're going to give you 0.2. Well, that's a really cool question. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of elements to it. Okay. But boiling it down to the, I guess, base of what it is. Like we were talking about mechanical meters, Chris just mentioned how we can get half a percent out of a mechanical meter. What is that mechanical meter still 
what, what is it? It's still mechanical, right? So swings of this or that, they can affect the accuracy. So getting back into it, how critical is your process? Are you blending? Are you batching? Are you adding things to food? Are you doing things that are critical in nature that you have to have a certain uh, concentration of X chemical, whatever that may be? So it's a very, very important thing that there are industries that need that kind of thing. You know, the truth of it is we can calibrate down to 0.05%. <laughs> Which is unreal. Yeah, that's crazy. And uh, that kind of accuracy is absolutely needed, especially when you're talking about chemicals, yeah. right? Because the way that these things are blended, the way your chemicals are made, whether it's a 2K system, your product's only as good as its concentration, mm -hmm. as its consistency. Yep. So, and that, and that consistency has a lot to do with the longevity of that product once it's in the market. If you've got something that's... Uh, um, a glue or, or some kind of a fastener type situation. If if that mixture is off, yeah, it might not bond. It might not bond. You're it exactly may, right. May not last. So, and what does that do to the company? It is the name of the company in jeopardy. I mean, there are a lot of companies that you know that that's it. Right. right. Think of think of the massive recalls that we've seen on thing. You know, you name the product, yeah, whatever. Absolutely. You know, that can cripple a company. Absolutely. So you mentioned turn down a few times. When y'all say turn down, yeah, because I know Chris mentioned it too. So what what is turn down in a meter? Okay. So I'll give you the definition, and then I'm going to give you an application. Give me the application cool first. Okay. Then cool. I might understand the definition. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, two weeks ago, we were in a chemical facility. And we were speaking to them about, hey, we actually need a mag meter in this particular process. And what we were kind of figuring out is what they're really saying is we want a Coriolis meter. We don't think it's going to be affordable. So what we did is we kind of went through the process. And it was really cool because it was just DI water, deionized water. Mm -hmm. And it was part of their process. I said, okay, here are the process conditions. It's X temperature. It's all these different things. It's X concentration. But our, we need it to be able to read from one and a half to 250 gallons a minute. Okay. We start doing the math there, and that's that's that turn down ends up being a, about a 250 to one turn down, which is extreme, right? That's a lot. Because what happens when you when you want any kind of an instrument, whether it's a pressure transducer, whether it's a flow meter, uh, whether it's an RTD, a you know, the thermistor, whatever that could be, you really want to be in that meat, that 80%, right? Because as far as like a pressure transducer, let's say there's going to be drift at your low end because there's just that pressure is variable. There are things that can happen here. Mm. Well, the same is similar with a flow meter. So at the top and at the bottom of your flow range, it's in, in very important that you understand there is a little bit obviously under that that we have range on and then there's a little bit above that right we want to be in that meat of the 80 percent. so when you start going beyond that that's where problems can occur so what we did is we actually got the proper meter we kind of looked at some things it was interesting because the thing that to your point how can i guys sell this and how, how can we be effective in selling this um what we saw is that the instrument they were using wasn't properly fitted. The metrics they gave us wasn't correct. So when we went back over historical data and usage, what we saw is actually there was a lot more that they needed and the density was one of them. Well, what was interesting is their flow range was so low because they were using a meter that couldn't determine density or couldn't see the density. And as the temperature swings obviously the output would change or what they see the output being would change. So it was real interesting in how we kind of put all that down. So turn down is the overall ratio of the measurement that a meter or an instrument can measure accurately. Okay. So okay. a whole lot of stuff for a very concise answer there. But And so we want a lower turn down or we want a wider turn down wider most turn of the down. time. Okay. Most of the time. Because the lower the turn down, the smaller the turn down, um the 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 smaller your window of accuracy or window of operation is gonna be. Okay. So okay. thank you. Um,
Do we want to cover anything else? Do we want to talk about uh, the data collection itself? Like, what does that look like? Um, well, what we can say here on data collection is it's a multi-metric, uh, a multi-metric um, instrument. So instead of getting just a single metric of flow, again, you can get multiple things that uh, you can take out of it from temperature to density and all these, you know, flow rate. So as far as that's concerned, having a single meter that can take the place of multiple instruments, that is a high value when you're starting to talk about Coriolis metering. So when, when you're looking at the way that it's outputting data, it's very uncomplicated. And how do you output data from a meter? So I'm, I'm, I'm running fluid through a meter. Right. And now I'm going to send it digital and like, how does it send? Well, that's interesting. And the beauty of uh, technology, the way we have it, so we can do everything from pulse to Modbus. Even beyond our meter, we can take our Modbus signal, turn it into Ethernet. So that you can really do so much from 4 to 20, uh, from pulse to, like I said, Modbus, all the way with external uh, with external implements, you can turn it into whatever signal. Very cool. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of value. At and that point, you can do anything. You can tie it truly, anywhere. Truly. Yeah. Truly. Okay. You can just, you can manipulate that data whatever you need to get whatever absolutely extrapolate whatever you're what it is you're looking for exactly yeah all right so what are some applications you see so like people using coriolis meters that are getting the data like why are they getting that data that's a really good question the biggest thing that we see um whenever i'm selling into an application that's never had a coriolis meter they're basically using either multiple instruments to do what one of ours could. A Consolidation of equipment. Exactly. Protection of maintenance. Right. Okay. Or the cost historically of something that could give them higher accuracy, that being Coriolis, was so prohibitive. Okay. So what we see a lot of times is people say good enough when good enough might not be. And so um, when we're implementing Coriolis meters into, let's say something that's as simple as just water. Goodness, uh, it's it's incredible that you can show these. Be just just kind of backing up. Even Coriolis technology is from the seventies. I mean, it's one of those things that people are like, "Man, this had to be like the latest grist." That's really you know not. But again, cost was so prohibitive, right? That only these specialty chemical, high end, you know, blending, batching type uh, processes were using. Now it's one of those things that. As technology gets newer or older, the manufacturing, you get more efficient at it, right? The understanding of the technology, you get a lot better at that. And so ostensibly what happens is the cost comes down. And w what we've seen, though, is we see our competitors, not to name any names, but we see our competition where they're still way up there in cost. And it's really cool to see whenever guys are implementing these for the first time, especially as far as just their data. And I hate, we need more of that. What we see is when we show them what the meter can do, they're like, at that cost a fortune. <laughs> it's like, well, actually, no. And seeing that like change of, are you telling me something that's not true? And to, wow, we can see our data being used almost empirically through simulation or whatever that may be it's really cool to watch that change and see someone achieve a metric that they've been chasing for years it's a really cool thing to see our instrument provide them the information they needed 20 years ago and finally they can get it it's a really cool thing yeah it's a really cool thing let's uh go down through maybe some of the industries that that this this is involved in or can help. I mean, I would I would imagine we know manufacturing, we know painting, we know yeah. lots of different. Yeah. But what about like food, pharmaceutical? You know, are there applications in those worlds also? A absolutely. It'd almost be easier to name the applications where that you can't. Not. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Sand. Don't use it in <laughs> sand. Deal. <laughs> Deal. Don't try to cram rocks in this. No. It, but seriously, <laughs> it's. Uh, it's one of those where, like, the the uh, the application list is shorter of what you can't do. Right. It's like solids and aggregates and things that aren't liquid. The beauty of this is, is the flexibility of the meter. We can see gas as well. 
So what we do, there's a, there's a really strong partner of mine that does things like helium reclamation. Goodness, oh, we wow. can't process helium quickly enough in the industrial world. We can't process it quickly enough to use it and sell it. So the, the game changer has been reuptake and reclamation. So what they're doing is they're encapsulating a air conditioner cool. We'll say like a big, you know, rooftop unit. And they're putting helium in to do leak testing. Well, as that bleeds, we can actually recapture that. We can actually see once it's released how much has been recaptured versus how much was put in. So what we're doing is we're using the same helium over and over and over. What does that do for your use, your cost? So it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, your ROI is almost immediate. So so gas to fluid, and then as we get in fluid, you said no rocks. No rocks. Is there a a high viscosity thresh point before I turn from like a fluid to a rock? Okay. You have a number? What what you're talking about? Like a set of boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what's interesting is there's not a number because there's not a number that I know because the uh, the properties of a process are so variable. Um, for instance, we have other um, we actually replace some of our positive gear meter, uh, positive displacement gear meters, spur gear meters mm-hmm. with helical gear meters because of the pressure drop. But because it was so highly viscous, why lithium grease to be exact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something that wouldn't you you would have such a hard time. You would rupture the meter before you could get the appropriate um the appropriate uh uh frequency, if you will, the f- appropriate deflection so you can actually meter something that thick. You would blow the meter up before you got to the point where you're actually flowing the mm-hmm. material correctly. So there is definitely a limit, but the beauty of this, and we've actually, gosh, with that water application, I was telling the water glycol application, we've, we've, the value add of AW Lake just as a company is we're not just going to say, you have a process, here's a Coriolis meter. Right. The expertise that we have in house, the expertise that we hold ourselves to as far as just a high level is, we're going to we're going to provide the solution with your process in mind, not with dollar bills or with this because we want to sell it. Yeah. Well that's what Chris talked about, like a custom solution. Yeah. You know, True. so if I can flow it, if I can make this material flow, right, then we can meter it. Absolutely. And that's really what it is. And again, we have the appropriate tools where we can say, hey, this isn't the right thing or this is the wrong size or in the, what you want to see as far as flow rate, this might not be it. I mean, we're very, very uh, precise on what we spec in and making sure that it's appropriate. All right. So we need to, we're going to wrap up here pretty soon, but I want to give you guys an opportunity to talk about any kind of successes in our partnership you touched on it a little bit when you first were out of the gate, but mm-hmm. is there anything in mind with that in mind that you guys want to bring up? Well, my my first experience with AW Lake was putting uh, oil into a, into an engine. Okay, and so this was a customer that, like you said, it was a visual process as with an operator, and they manually did it. And so this was uh, I came at AirPower twelve years ago, so this was probably eleven years ago. It was like my first introduction to to metering. And so this whole automation push, this data, they had some engines go off the line and they didn't, they didn't run, you know, they blew. Um, but of course the operator's like, I, I did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I did my part. Um, and so we automated it. It was pretty rudimentary, but it was an AW Lake system. It was a batch counter. Uh, we counted blow. Uh, so we knew how much, and then we date time stamped it. So we know, you know, when they did it. Um, since then it's continued to shift and I don't, I'm not exactly sure what they're using now, but just like that whole mentality of, you know, let's, let's trust, but verify and AWA is going to, they're going to do the verify part. Right. Um, uh, so it's good product. No, that's, and, and that's, that's very, very cool. I, that was one of our older products. And really the truth of it is what we took and had in that type of product, we just shrunk it down and made it a lot more available, mm-hmm. you know, um, to the point of air power, one of the things that y'all have just blown me away with is your engineering expertise. 
not only in their ability to take a ton of information, say, here it is, but also in their ability to roll with it as conditions change. It's not the engineers who are like, well, this is what I said, so that must be correct, right? You have a bunch of guys who are humble enough to be like, hey, we don't know it all. We're putting a lot on you. Let's work together. And uh, Michael John, who, you know, I mean, it's amazing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we think so, too. Yeah, yeah, right. Like it. It. Uh, but, but between him and Brian, and there are several other people, you know, just in that, in the, when you deal with air power, when I deal with air power, it is such a cool thing because you can see the cohesion of what y'all do and the solution that you provide. And it's really confidence inspiring to be able to work with a company, to work with the individuals of the company who not only understand process so heavily, who not only are experts at what they do, but again, have the humility to say, we don't know it all. And that's where we come in. There's such a beautiful mesh in the teamwork and the approachability of it. That is really second to none. So that's one of the things that I absolutely love working with y'all about is because you have such high capability and just generally a high knowledge threshold. When it goes both ways too, because we know we have one source to call. You know, we don't have to pick up the phone and call these other people, but, you know, we do call AW Lake yeah. and y'all will help us out. That's it. You know, you'll design it, you'll help spec it, uh, and we get a really good solution. Yeah. So thank y'all. Yes, sir. I think this is a great point to wrap it up. That was awesome. <laughs> so uh, talk about a segue. Yeah. Andrew, thank you so much for your partnership with us. Yeah. I truly thank appreciate you, it. And, yeah. and for you and Chris both for taking the time to come up and uh, sit down with us. Absolutely. Kyle, as always. And my travel. Thanks, man. All right. So close out here. Remember, all of this is at airpower-usa.com. Uh, if you want the audio versions or the video versions, airpowerairwaves.com. Uh, any questions, you could get answers right now, as long as it's not midnight tonight, at 1-800-334-1001. And I'm going to wrap this up like I always do by saying, manufacture it a great day. Thank you for joining the Air Power Airwaves podcast. Air Power Airwaves is a production of Air Power Inc. and Air Power Live Studios and is hosted by Travis Steyerwald. For more information, please visit airpowerairwaves.com. For more information on all of our products, brands, and manufacturing solutions, please visit airpower-usa.com. If you have any questions or need product support, please contact Air Power at 1-800-334-1001.